how does to have a diorama for a dialogue. So of course it's going to be in a dialogue mode. And what I want to put across is certain kind of pointers to discuss and debate, some across across the experts, some across ourselves, and some to just linger and even after the high spirits to kind of sleep over with, you know, to start take tomorrow with maybe another thought. So it's only that. And I'm definitely not a moderator. I have and it's always that syndrome that the most mischievous student is made a monitor, so he has to try and behave. So it's in that mode that I simply want to share certain kinds of pointers. So beginning with uh, reversing the sequence of material, technology and architecture, since we are all designers here, I would say architecture, technology and material in that preference and priority, how do we kind of see these uh, coming and what are the kind of issues. So timeless way of building in which there is always a paradox and it's in that I think if we hear everybody's kind of point of view responses that uh, if we think that architecture is a sum total, the holistic architecture is a sum total of culture, climate and construction, construction in terms of technology which also is material and technology in that sense. For any given place, even after climate change, climate is more or less constant. Culture may change but at a very slow pace, maybe after generations. But it's a technology which might change at the wink of an eye. So on one hand it's very temporal, while as a paradox on the other hand, architecture has to be timeless. And that is the kind of paradox in which we need to debate this. So it's not about new in, you know, innovations, but it's about kind of debating this dimension of it, that architecture lasts beyond us, and that timelessness of it, versus what was temporal in terms of technology which might change tomorrow. So in that idea, how architecture is an alchemy, and we have lived with that right from your childhood. You know, as every child, we have played an architect, you know. I don't think any child went to a school to understand how sand behaves. You have to moisten the sand to kind of, and you can only mold it, you can scoop it out, you never can make. But instead if you play with a play card, then it has to be a pyramid. Versus if it's a block, it has to interlock. This came intuitive to us, and this became there for the response and the form by the same kid with three different tools, three different kind of manifestations out of those tools. Point is that that was the intuitive innocence with which we dealt with it. Have we as an architect played a child to live into that kind of a primary innocent instinct? Material and technology definitely are the tools to get what we have in our mind to realize. So what is basically first created is the seed, the DNA is in the mind, is in the soul, it's in the kind of uh, inner thing which is physically manifested by material and technology. But material need not be invented, it's just the way with technology you might treat it. Stone has been there from Paleolithic age to even today, but maybe the way it got processed, so from scooping out into the caves and the rock uh, sort of architecture to dressing it and assembling it to kind of creating slabs with very kind of thin and yet very kind of polished sort of a plane so to say. So the thickening of the mass reduced to a plane. Same thing about the wood. So wood has been wood has been wood. It's just how the kind of properties and that have been taken from a cast iron where it's entirely in a compressive zone versus the cable or the and it becomes a tensile. So the whole way it behaves changes. Now in that light, so is it the steel and glass doing the architecture for us or it's something else that has to inform steel and glass to be way that it should be, you know. So it's where I'm saying it's reversing it. Steel and glass doesn't have to only translate as this and to kind of then think that that's the edge. For example, brick, and we saw how many different ways could brick do what it does. It's not to catalog that, but like, you know, we can't say that if you ask the brick what it wants to be, and the brick would say, I want to be an arch. So it's in that light that, or, I mean, Louis Kahn brought the local material as brick with a three-dimensional arch, and that was the kind of way. 
So material with technology became then a manifestation of architecture. That was still not an architecture, but now with light, now with the way the kind of volume, the way kind of textures get manifested, that same brick has become architecture. That has become a space. So it's for that. So essentially, to conceive this, we have to take tool and the technology as a vehicle. So therefore, as we know, space making has to go through these five basic filters. Timeless aesthetics, because building that will last beyond us. Sociocultural appropriate, because always you do it for somebody. Environmental and resource management, so sustainability, economic affordability, then will be viable. And of course, structural strength, so that it spends on. Now, is this not technology? Is it not material? And is it? But if you see any of these, I'm at Zamdabadi not going to put a bet that where does it come from? I'm sure it's very logical and very kind of natural to conceive at least the zone in terms of climate, in terms of cultural sending, as well as the resource base where they might come from. But I'm willing to bet any bet on this, where does this come from? And if I put these names, I'm sure we all innocently will accept, but I could have just, I know, after some whatever, milk to beer, put any name that came to my mind and will still accept it. And why limit to us here, put any name from the country and the city, and it kind of would work the same. Now, is that what the material and technology brings? That's where I think answering many questions and then finding one answer that answers most questions is the rule of the game. We tend to take it too direct, linear, and quick. For example, if child is dirtying the attire by crawling around the floor, do we make the attire design such that it's like a mop, let it go around and take the floor, you know? So sometimes, you know, we have to think that it's beyond. Both of these are Kerala, and I think we need to question which is the architecture having come with the right appropriate contextual response to material technique, and of course, place and people. Jaipur, both are Jaipur, both are Kolkata. So, for example, material technological innovation, but eventually what does it do? Is this, this is very, you know, it's IIT Madras, pre-casting, house ready in 22 days, 28 days, and all that, has it translated into space, architecture, and the kind of whatever quality of life for eventual user, and concrete if it had a certain kind of its own property, how has that been exploited here that even after 70, 80 years, this one has remained to be, not because it's Kabuzia, but on its own property of the material and technology, and what way does it translate? And to me, there, I use always frequently as one of my favorite examples here, Vietnam War Memorial. Why? Just two simple polished granite stone as architecture, and it has yet to be, to me, more emotional space making to be found than this. Maya did two wall out of granite slab. Now granite slab as material connotes with a tombstone in a particular faith. So this is a collective tombstone of American soldiers that perish. The names being given the dignity so that you don't know 39 people died, you know Amar Singh died or you know whoever, you know. So there is a dignity given. Two, when you put like that simple plane, but with a kind of sloping ground, it starts giving you the volume. And two things like this, it points finger at two particular places where the laws are up here, are in the field. That is the parliament, and the other side, Lincoln Memorial. Mr. Lincoln, is this the idea of freedom that you know one country bullies the other? So to me, it's a fantastic satire by pointing to fingers. That simple plane and being glossy, when you go around, you're not a passive spectator. You see these names floating in front of you to think why my father should have died, why my you know baby was uh, part of this, who was to blame, am I a new spectator, should I vote for Trump, is gun a right idea, is a birthright, etc, etc. And the most fantastic part, how can material and technology evoke emotion? So we're not talking about architecture as an esoteric thing. Imagine a scenario where a 22-year-old boy comes and wanting to you know, pay homage to his father, David Alexander. And similarly, a 65-year-old mother coming to pay homage to David Copperfield. Now, both of them come. First, there's an interactivity. 
We have to look for the name, and the trick is that the names are not like telephone directory alphabetic order. So I would go around, they were found probably in the time that they were seen there. So it's random for anybody. So I come in and say, ah, David. But no, no, this is David Peter. This is not my father. So first I acknowledge many Davids who lost their lives. I'm not the only son. I'm not the only mother. And then I go, ah, David Alexander. Ah, David Copperfield. I can touch Harris, my daddy, my baby. Then I put a piece of paper, rubber charcoal, take a very proud, privileged memory next to my heart, put a flower and write a note, Daddy, I never saw you, but you were the greatest dad who died for the country. Baby, you are not around, but I hold my head very high when I meet with other people. Now what to wall as associational aspect, as partial conditions, as interactive and emotional? And that's why I like because it's just two walls doing it. That's what is the capability of a material and the technology. And I mean, to our surprise and pride, that granite was brought from India. Maybe it was cheap, maybe it was good, but the reason was it was a neutral territory, so not to kind of uh, be partial to one. So that's how it goes. And that's probably the standpoint from where I'm saying. Same way, it's not material technology. Therefore, as architects, how do you align it? So there's organization, there's per, you know, proportion. Stone is a stone, is a stone. It's not even richly ornate. But like in a step well, the whole narrative that you create, this simple outcrop of the stone invites you to come here, to go down, you are made to climb up. Once you take climb, now the vista further unfolds to you. And gradually, as you turn, you get this you know, welcome signs from the thing. You can't fly till the end, but it tells you I am here. So there is a suggestion, but you have to take a step. But every step, your sense of enclosure changes, your vignette changes, your intensity of light changes, and with that diversity and variety, with utmost joy as well as involvement, you come to the end, and only at the end, whatever was simply an excuse, the whole essence was in the journey, and therefore, with time, with sort of uh, nature changing, and of course, the association also etched onto that particular wall, the meaning changes. It becomes a holistic, experiential, and emotionally charged place. Same way, simple vernacular, this is Kutch, harsh climate, but they even pro-worthy for the earthquake resistance. The Virat Kai Congress system didn't stop the same place, three-year-old structure to withstand. But 67 year old, this I won't get into technicalities. But how they have been able to express their culture, their craft, their associations, and of course, it's both scientific as well as this. Their notions attached, and sometimes, like they say, concrete is a plague of the region. Whenever we think concrete, we think of strength, but it's such a weak material that unless you had reinforcement, it would not stay. As against earth, this is uh, Yemen. 150 year old high rise, I'm not kind of pitching for one, but if you use it for the right character, even Alburs are the tallest building where entire load goes on earth, how on earth can earth be a big material, okay? So it's just that if you subject it to compression, it will not be a problem. Not only that, the environmental obligation or the kind of energy cost, the performance cost, etc. For example, we might say today's technology allows us to have double glaze, joint tainted glass, etc., etc. But simple logic is that simple transparent glazing, if it was uh, double glaze, you would reduce it to 90, tainted on oil technology would bring it to 40. But commonsensical one meter awning integrated in your aesthetic would already reduce it to 25%. So the point is what comes first? Definitely take advantage of the, you know, energy costs. One aluminum Coca-Cola can as material recycled can save energy equivalent of running television for 20 minutes. Why? Because aluminum may be 116 times more energy intensive than that. Can that material be subjected to a technology and a design that it can be recycled with new avatar? This was Bobo World Bottle that instead of round serrations and square shape made it possibly to get even the wall to go high with spirits. So the bottle throne can become a wall for this. This is something we have tried in a slum housing. 
where an empty plastic bottle nobody gives you five pesa for, can the internal reflection become a source of light? This was again how do you transform? Even in a dry state, there are enough liquor bottles to be found in Amdaba, and that is where the wall became a high spirit wall with western low sun captured and therefore dazzling and glowing. Widows of the slum with thumb pressure filling in the sand to make this no value thrown battle, plastic pearl battle, a pet battle into a two and a half rupee equivalent of brick. Same with uh, all kinds of uh, transformation of that, even the digital data can become a handy thing. So, point is that you can innovate new. If you want to know this, this aerographene that is soon going to come, it's not floating, it's actually resting on this tip of the husk, or so to say, uh, by its, and it's a strong material. So, innovations this is uh, all plastic put into a brick block. This is uh, algae which actually gets from the sun and it's an organic envelope which absorbs the carbon dioxide and so. So technology has its place but point is that it comes as a tool to support the kind of concerns, the values that one puts in and how do we translate that. Uh, so just a same age old palette but in the way that you put it, it becomes contemporary and yet arguably lasts for longer which is how do you integrate it with light? How do you, like use of craft from traditional to kind of present day technology, all can coexist. So it's not a battle. It's not today, now and then kind of a thing. I think there are some constances about the concerns and the ways that it appeals and it kind of excites us. And yet with today's thing, this is just a memorial that uh, we did with all natural palette of material age-old material and yet with contemporary tools of CNC machines as well as the three-dimensional curve in n number of ways that is possible, but how it inspires and engages is more important. So I just conclude with this dialogue which, you know, the, the glamour and the beauty, if that lasted forever, is what actually we aspire for, but as a fashion, it might fade away. Aspen fog chal raya, but you would forget two years down the line what fog was about. Versus, uh, so this is grandson asking grandpa, how old are you? And grandpa says, son, I was born before television, penicillin, polio shots, frozen food, z dogs, contact lenses, frisbees, credit cards, laser beams, ballpoint pens, pantyhose, air conditioners, dishwashers, and men hadn't yet walked onto the moon. Your grandmother and I got married first and then lived together. Every family had a father and a mother. We were before computer dating, dual carriers, daycare centers, and group therapy. Our lives were governed by Ten Commandments, good judgment and common sense. We thought fast food was what people ate during the fasting days. Pizza had McDonald's and instant coffee were unheard of. In my day, folk was a cold drink, pot was something your mother cooked in. Rock music was grandmother's lullaby, age were helpers in principal's office. Cheap meant a piece of wood, hardware was found in a hardware store, and software wasn't even a word. And we were the last generation to actually believe that lady needed a husband to have a baby. No wonder people call us old and confused and say there is a generation gap. Now, 66 year old is what this has transformed to. Many of the younger generation uh, here might not even can see what kind of a life, what kind of an era would this have been. Was it possible to even live? But uh, with all these, I always give an example that if uh, 60th birthday of father a very successful IT professional from forest wishes on a Skype for two hours that hello daddy how are you you know wonderful and father is also happy that my son can't come from this far but on 60th birthday has remembered me I love this technology and gadget I can see his face and whatnot son look how fine I am and all that but still he goes to sleep thinking that I wish my kids were around if the same kid even after two hours of sky, gives a surprise visit. Even Ahmedabad, the miser father would not slap and say, those are all the they were in a laptop layata. He can only hug and cry and emotion. Son, despite all this, you just thought of me, you just came for me. Tomorrow even death comes, now no problem. You made my life, I love you. So there are certain premises on which whether technology or whatever can complement. So the premise is uh, not that technology is a tool, not that technology is the around which architecture has to go. It is the primary concern of 
balance between human to human, that is society, and human to nature, because we are an aspect of that. When we balance that, all that comes out could be of support to eventually the goal is how do we add value and how does that help in quality of life? What have we made ourselves to after technology? One technology united the family, the other technology arguably is questionable in terms of that. Was this not surfing CCTV and WhatsApp? And after 100 years, what has changed is from print to digital, are we really any different? So the point is we can empower making the best use of it, but our priorities have to be right. We have to know why are we doing it. Is it not the MRIs and the blood tests which the doctor should rely on? It should be other way around that he already knows. Maybe it's a confirmatory tool for which he goes to that. Otherwise, you know, there will be no. So we can empower basically to improve the quality of life. Maybe rather than giving Gandhian currency uh, the value, we have to make Gandhian value the currency. That's where I feel that we can take up from where our grandmother left, from there we can take up, and from where our kids would take it further. So inspired by yesterday, inspired by tomorrow. And welcome to Trevor's in the immensity of time and space and notion and reality. Thank you for your patient listening. <laughs> and this is just